let's take a look at how Redux works on a high level. There are three main concepts or components of Redux. Actions, reducers, and the store. To more easily understand these components, let's use a metaphor. Imagine there's a high-tech warehouse somewhere with actual robots doing all the work for us humans. The warehouse is responsible for storage, so that's our store. The robot does all the heavy lifting and modifies whatever is in the warehouse. He's our reducer. A store can have multiple reducers. This means that our little robot friend doesn't have to do everything in the warehouse, just the parts that we tell him to care about. As our store grows larger, it will make sense to introduce multiple reducers, or robots, to keep our code maintainable. Finally, as the human overlords, we tell the robots what to do. This is called an action, nothing more than an instruction with a specific type. For example, we could instruct the robot to prepare an item for loading, to remove an item from the warehouse, and so on. We can optionally add more data to the action, this is called a payload. For example, when we add a new item to the warehouse, we need to not only tell our robot to store the item, but also what to store. In this case, that would be the data for the item we're about to add. Redux attempts to solve the gnarly issue of state management by requiring us to follow certain rules and principles. The first of which is the single source of truth, which basically means all of your application state is stored in a single, possibly gigantic tree. That might seem a little weird at first, but it makes sense, especially due to Redux's modular nature, which means we can still manage code in small chunks. Having a big state tree also allows us to easily serialize and store app state, for example, resuming a user session when they log back in, and so on. It also makes it fairly simple to implement an undo-redo functionality, because having one big single state tree makes it a lot easier to track changes across your state and save every change, allowing you to go back to a certain state in the past. The second principle is state is read-only, which means that the data from our store flows down to the components. This also means that changes happen in one place, namely the store. This makes it much easier for us to track changes across our application state because they can only happen in one place. And the last principle is, changes are made with pure functions. That means that our state tree is transformed by functions called reducers. Those reducer functions are pure and simply return the next state based on a given action. This means we need to pay extra attention to immutability. We don't want to modify any data that is outside of our reducer function including the state itself. Instead, we simply return a new state object that has been updated. We already know when to use Redux, but we should take a second to talk about where to use Redux. Using Redux doesn't mean we should be storing every small piece of state in a Redux store. A good rule of thumb, given by Redux's creator Dan Abramov, is to do whatever is less awkward. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense for us to store a component state in a global Redux store. For example, if we have some kind of toggle button, we really don't have to store its enabled state in a global store. The component itself is perfectly capable of keeping track of its own state for that. State should be stored globally in Redux when it gets too complex to handle in a single component, or when several unconnected components need access to the same data. For example, let's say we're composing an email draft and want to get back to it later on. That means we're going to close our email composer, resulting in its local state being lost. Using Redux, we can store our draft data in the store and then return to it at a later point, long after the email composer component is already gone. 